This conference will now be recorded. And we can go ahead and get hey, started. Okay, Jen, let's go ahead and get started if we can. Okay, so it looks like we are calling the meeting to order here at 9.33, right? That sounds good. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Bruce. Uh, just a few minutes prior to the meeting, I lost my internet um, service. So if it comes back on, I'll sign on through my computer. Um, for now, I'm on the phone. I want to welcome everybody um, to the October meeting of MASCD directors. I will ask Chris Brown, the secretary, to call the roll call. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Allegheny. Anna Rundle. Okay. Anna Rundle. Baltimore. I see Brian Riddle on the line for Anna Rundle. I'm not sure if he stepped away, but we may want to circle back. Okay. I'll I'll run back through once we get through. If there's okay. Any <clears throat> Baltimore. <coughs> Calvert. Here. Can you verify that you can hear me? We can. Okay. I, okay. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. Airline. Airline. Carol to talk to him. Cecil Cecil's here. Charles Charles is here. Rochester. Dorchester's here. Thank you. Frederick. Frederick. Jared. Jared. Harford. Harford is here. Thank you. 
Howard. Howard. Present. Thank you. Kent. Thank you. Montgomery. Montgomery here. Thank you. Georges. Prince Georges. Queen Anne's. Is that somebody from Queen Anne's? St. Mary's. Gummerset. Gummerset's here. Thank you. Talbot. Talbot. Washington. Washington. Wacomico. Wacomico's here. Thank you. Worcester. Worcester. All right. I'm going to go back through those who I didn't get an answer from. You're here. Please let me know. Anna Rundle. Anna Rundle here. Thank you. Baltimore. Caroline. Carol. Catoctin. Frederick. Garrett. Prince George's. Queen Anne's. Talbot. Washington. Worcester. Excuse me, Carol. 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 Carol's here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I don't think that's a quorum. Um, one, two, three, four, we have 14. Okay. More than half, More than so. Half, so. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, is everybody, everybody, got, everybody got to review the review. minutes? Make a motion to approve them as sent, Carol. Is there a second? Montgomery <laughs> second. Okay. Uh, in keeping with remote, all those goes to the men. So moved. So moved. Treasures report. Treasures report. This is Marguerite. I'm trying to get a hold of Mike. I, I did talk with him, uh, or I texted just after nine, and he said he was all set. So he may be struggling. I'm going to give him a call. So if we can just uh, move on and come back to this. Thanks, Marguerite. He was on earlier. So we'll see if we can.
Did we lose Bruce? No, yeah, I was muted. Okay. I was talking <laughs> for five or ten minutes here. If we could, um, we'll come back to the treasurer's report if it's all right. We're going into discussion issues. If um, the Envirothon group is ready for an update. This is Craig. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, just a few things to report for the Envirothon. Um, we are planning to have an in-person state Envirothon next year. We have reservations at Mount St. Mary's University in Frederick County for June 21 through the 23rd. Of course, at this time, we have no idea if we'll be able to do it, but we are optimistic that we can get back in meeting in person. So that is our plans moving forward for 2022. Also, also the National Envirothon next year will be held in Ohio at Miami University, July 24th through the 30th. And the fifth issue for this coming year is waste to resources. And the learning objectives have been posted on the, I believe on the Maryland website and the NCF uh, Envirothon website as well. One positive note, uh, we now have a representative from the Maryland DNR Forest Service serving on our Envirothon Steering Committee. It's been quite a few years since they decided that they could not have anyone participate with us. And as of about a month ago, we now have a new representative. So we're looking forward to having the Maryland Forest Service back on our committee. And we still need a representative from the lower shore area from MASCD. So if anyone knows somebody, a supervisor, an employee of the conservation district in the lower shore, uh, we would love to have a person from that area serving on our steering committee. And one final note, I am going to be stepping down as the Envirothon coordinator at the end of this year. And I just wanted to thank MASCD for your support of the program and especially Marguerite. It's been wonderful to work with for quite a few years. I've enjoyed working with her and she does a lot of work for the Envirothon. And I know our executive committee is looking for, for a replacement and hopefully we'll have somebody on board come uh, 2022. Anyone have any questions? Okay, Craig, thank you so much for that report and thank you for your years of service. It was greatly appreciated. And it, it certainly showed all your hard work in the groups that uh, have come through in Barathon. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce can, Bruce, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, this is Mike. Mike McGinnis, Paul McGinnis. Right. Yes, sir. Let's, let's go back to the treasurer's report if you're ready, Mike. Sorry about the, I don't know what was going on. I could hear everybody. I talked to Jen earlier, but put a little mute and it wouldn't come back on. So uh, I understand. So, it's all yours. I got, yeah, I got missed on roll call there too. So Baltimore County, uh, they want to mark that for make sure. Uh, so anyway, uh, we'll start with the quarterly report uh, from 7 one to 10 21 uh, the uh, endowment had uh, a little over a uh, $500 profit for a uh, total net income there of $25,82.59. And then uh, if we move on down to the environment, uh, the net income there was uh, $12,336.39. And then if we move to the last page, you'll see the MACD. Had a net income there of $790.75 with all dues paid up at this point, I think. Um, so we have a total net income there of $15,709.73. Uh, the balance sheet for the MASCD uh, for the endowment 
uh, is a total of $506,679.73. The Envirothon with their PNC checking and money market account, uh, we have a $110,000. $246.46 and a MASCD of a total of $227,697.18. Uh, I think Jen's going to speak about the, the grants and proposal for the new budget for the draft later. So, any questions? Any questions for Mike on the financial report, treasurer's report? If there are not, can I have a motion to accept the treasurer's report? Carol, move to accept. Is there a second? Why can't go second? Okay. All those opposed to approving the treasurer's report, signify by saying aye. So moved. Uh, if Jen, you're ready, we'll go to the director's report and grants update. Yeah, give me just one sec to switch my screen back here to the agenda. I've been having my own technical difficulties with the chat this morning. Um, okay, so a lot of the executive director's report, my updates are going to be covered somewhere else on the agenda, either in new business. We've been doing a lot of work to uh, lay the groundwork for next year's MASB annual meeting and um, the NACD Northeast Region meeting. So I'll hold off on that. Um, later on, we've also got an update for um, the regional small ponds meetings um, and, and the budget as well. So um, since those are all addressed later on in the agenda, I, I won't address them here. Um, but with the grants updates, I do have a few. Um, so we've had a longstanding agreement with NRCS. Uh, we're working on an extension for that. Um, now, in past years, that has covered um, the development of CREP and CRP plans, as well as providing clerical and administrative support for EQIP and CTA. And I think, as everybody knows, um, that has been um, reduced, the need for that capacity and that help has been reduced in recent years, and especially NRCS was fortunate to be able to hire uh, a lot of new staff, and so they're not looking to um, have the support to write the CREP plans, and in many counties where there is a program support specialist, they're also looking to cut back the EQIP and CTA portion of the grant, so there's a few districts remaining um where they are going to be looking for that support uh going forward and so that's where the extension comes in and and where we're looking to make sure that we have that support in place so there's also uh, a private engineering grant that we have or an agreement with we that we have with nrcs um to provide design services up around uh the the central region and so that's been extended for another year um and then moving to uh, the Campbell Foundation, we've got two grants with them. One has to do with increasing conservation district capacity, and that's following up on um, uh, the the items in the state committee's leadership self-assessment that that all of the districts did. So. Um, I've been working with Alicia to uh, gather resources from all of the districts as they relate to um, policies and procedures and annual work plans, uh, employee manuals and things like that, and putting them up on uh, MASCD's website. And we'll also be using those to develop templates that the districts can use uh, in their own planning. Um, and so the other grant that we have with the Campbell Foundation uh, has to do with recognizing conservation stewardship. And so, um that relates to the FASCAP program. I gave an update that on that at the MASED annual meeting and there hasn't really been uh, much change on that. I'm working on trying to get up with a few partners to talk about opportunities to uh, either 
provide a, a premium for farmers or just promote farm stewardship and, and see how we can can add something to that program um, moving forward. So that's um, it's kind of on pause right now still while while we're trying to line up those conversations, I'd say. Um, and then with the Campbell Foundation, we're also uh, working to bring the the Leopold Conservation Award to Maryland for this year. Um, and so we're working with Farm Bureau on that. The Campbell Foundation has contributed the, the funding uh, for the award itself. Uh, and that will be announced at the Farm Bureau's convention in December. And so another grant that we have is uh, with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It's to, uh, for training. And so I'm working with NRCS and MDA um, to align, I'd say, the, the training plans and curriculums. We're working on a Maryland orientation training uh, to roll out uh, at the end of this year, the beginning of next. Um, and we're also working on creating a website where we can kind of house um, training workshops that are recorded either virtually or in person so that we can create a library for people to go back and, and reference information on demand when they need it. So, uh, and the last thing that I have for grants is that uh, MASCD applied for a new grant also with the Campbell Foundation where we're looking at a leadership initiative for managers. Um, and that was really based on some of the feedback and input that we got at the uh, annual meeting during the district managers meeting. Um, so we're looking to, um, the grant is looking to support um, a, a more in-depth training for managers um, based on, I think, a, an NRCS uh, Northeast region training, um, like excellence in, in supervision. I'm, the name uh, escapes me a little bit, but it's, it's something like that that's established that we're trying to make available um, to any managers who'd like to, to do that in Maryland. Um, it would also include a, a manager's manual and uh, some of the work that um, I've been working with Alicia on to bring the quarterly calls um, together to help with the coordination on that where we're um, offering just a kind of a lunch and learn opportunity um, for managers to, to get together and discuss how they address different topics and share information that way. And so we've had the first one of those. It was, um, um, I think, really successful. We had a lot of good feedback on it. And I look forward to uh, the opportunity to, to bring more of those together. So that's um, what I have for grants right now. It, does anybody have any questions? Okay, then that uh, settles my update or my report for now, um, recognizing that we'll address some of the other issues that we've been working on later on in the meeting. Okay, thanks, Jen. Any questions for Jen before we move on? Okay, let's um, move into partnership updates. Uh, MDA, if Hans is on the uh, line. Yep, I'm here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, just a few updates. Um, we have been working as far as trying to fill the, the new pin positions that were announced probably about almost two years ago, the 53 new pins. We've gone through our recruitment, the last round where nine interviews done with three weeks. Uh, we feel confident right now that we will be able to fill out the balance of those uh, positions and hope to have uh, folks in those seats in the district next month, the six HR is working that paperwork right now, making offers and so forth. So uh, hopefully you will be seeing some of those new folks coming in the door pretty quickly. Um, in addition to that, we know we do have some additional vacancies out there that have been a result of um, some uh, that have come across since uh, the pandemic. Plus we had an additional vacancy. So we will be focused on trying to fill those positions as soon as these uh, 53 are, are, are finalized. Um, um, in regards to the MAX program, um, we have changed regulations to um, up our cost share rates 
uh, or excuse me, our, our cost share to 100% on certain uh, practices. Uh, we've run up against, in some cases, the $50,000 cap uh, per project. We are in the process right now of putting language into sending over to AELR committee to raise that cap from $50,000 to $75,000. So that'll take um, a little time, but want to make sure that we're putting that out there on your radar. Um, next, um, new post-pandemic telework agreements. I believe have gone out to the districts. We will start implementing that um, next week. Uh, the difference between these te uh, this telework agreement than the one we had before really puts more uh, formal language in there on expectations, a matrix, um, accountability, and so forth. So uh, I know Byron and the area coordinators have been uh, working with uh, the districts, but um, just uh, stay tuned that, that that matrix and those telework agreements will start to go into effect next week. Um, next, um, just wanted to give everybody a little bit of update on where we are with CNMP planning. Um, there are 564 permits that are listed by MDE. Um, 267 uh, CNMPs have been uh, sent over to MDE for their review. 94 have been posted for public comment and 82 uh, APHOS have been permitted. Um, I, I want to mention that because I want to say a big thank you to our districts, to our CNMP planners, to the team that, you know, doing this. It's been a high priority, uh, but um, I think, you know, for most cases, things have been running pretty smoothly. We've had a couple little hiccups along the way, but uh, that's to be expected. But I want to say big kudos and thank you to the districts and a job well done. Still a lot more to do, but um, again, big thank you to everyone there. Um, Secretary Butler earlier this month hosted a meeting with the other ag secretaries within the Bay Watershed and met with Dr. Jewel Bernal, who uh, Dr. Bernal is the, I think she's the deputy secretary un, under USDA, um, and expressing um, support for the Chesapeake Resiliency Farm Initiative. It's a, a component of the Congressional Infrastructure Bill. Uh, this initiative would bring $737 million to the Chesapeake Bay watershed um, over 10 years. Uh, we fully support, you know, this initiative in, in trying to help meet our, our watershed and our Chesapeake Bay goals. Um, it does bring support from the, the, the state farm bureaus, uh, governors, administrations, and, and other and, uh, environmental groups that are out there. So I would say stay tuned um, as Congress starts to work through the infrastructure bill and, and figure out where all the funding is going to go. Um, I have been involved with a work group uh, with the Hughes Center and MDE on developing a process and a strategy on developing a climate vulnerability assessment report. Uh, this report will basically kind of lay out what are the needs to do the assessment report. That report is due uh, December 1. Um, we'll be going to the governor's office and, and onto, the, um, onto the legislature. I bring this up because um, the Hughes Center sponsored two workshops and also uh, sent out and has been putting out a survey for farmers and ag stakeholders to fill out the, um, and ask a number of questions on how climate change may be impacting their business, their operations, and so forth. If you haven't filled out that survey, I encourage you to go on the MDA website. There is a link there to um, if you could fill out that um, that survey and, um, and and submit it. I believe to date we've probably had about 100, 150 or so um, responses to that survey. So I, I think it's been pretty impressive. Uh, but um, as climate change continues to evolve and as we start to, and as we're tweaking our programs, we will be incorporating more climate change initiatives in our program. Um, this assessment report will be uh, vital to helping us make some of those determinations. 
Next, um, I have been involved again on another interagency work group um, around PFAS chemicals. Uh, you've probably seen these, um, some discussions about this in the news. These are what they're calling forever chemicals. Um, EPA is taking a, a more um, active um, regulatory approach to dealing with PFAS and primarily looking at um, detectable levels in drinking water and also um, analyzing fish tissues and so forth. I believe at this point right now there's been one location um, found in Maryland where they found some detectable levels of PFAS. Um, more closer to home, uh, there was some concerns in an article about um, PFAS in um, some of the mosquito spray that NDA is using. Uh, EPA analyzed the, those um, those products and found no PFAS chemicals in in those products. So, uh, but this is going to be more prevalent um, and more discussion, um, and we're we're staying trying to stay on top of it as as if there's any more discussion. Um, around agriculture and so forth. Um, Jen mentioned about, would talk mostly, or talk a little bit about CREP and so forth. Hopefully everybody has seen uh, the um, the $1,000 bonus that we're gonna be off, that we're offering right now for CREP forest buffers. Hopefully that will encourage um, new farm, you know, new operations and uh, new folks coming in to want to um, apply for that uh, program. Um, and then um, lastly, I um, just want to send out our condolences to our partners out in Frederick County and Anne Arundel County. We lost an employee, Jamie Snyder, about a month ago due to an auto accident and uh, one of our MDA employees. So our condolences to um, our folks. Jamie was certainly a, a valuable partner or valuable um, asset to the team and so forth out there. Um, other than that, Bruce, I think I think that's my report, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, Hans. Any questions for Hans? All right, um, moving on, NRCS update. Is there anyone on the line for that? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get off mute here. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I heard, can you hear yeah. me? Can you hear me, Bruce? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, sir. yeah, so uh, good morning to everyone, and um, I'll be uh, try to be brief with uh, this update or NRCS update. Uh, you know, there's a few things that I'll try to hit on here really briefly, and then certainly uh, there'll be opportunities for questions or anything that uh, concerns. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19, our budget, uh, a staffing update, and then uh, just some comments on some of the overall uh, department and agency priorities. Uh, and then, like I said, obviously, if I don't cover something that someone needs information on, I'll be happy to uh, uh, opine. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to the, to the partners. Thank you to MASCD and to all the districts out there. Uh, we've had another uh, outstanding year of getting conservation on the ground despite uh, all of the uh, ongoing pandemic and all the challenges that, that that brings about, you know, so I just want to say thank you to all every single uh, soil conservation district that we have out there, all of our partners uh, from uh, MDA to uh, the RCNDs to Extension to all of our partners uh, who work together uh, every day out there in the local counties to work with producers to get more conservation on the ground. Uh, it doesn't happen unless we're all partnering and communicating and working together. And uh, within a pandemic, that even becomes more critical. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the cooperation. Uh, you know, for the most part, we've had um, a lot of good discussion, co co cooperation and discussion amongst all the partners. And, you know, it, it could have been a whole lot more challenging than it's been. And I know a lot of our local um, staff and others would say it's, it's been probably overly challenging and probably more challenging than I really understand from, from my position. Uh, but certainly, again, I just want to say thank you. Uh, with that said, I just wanted to just uh, share with the partnership kind of where we are from a federal agency perspective as it re uh, relates to COVID. And we continue to, uh, to uh, run our protocols as NRCS and as a, a federal agency. Um, we are definitely preparing for a post-pandemic 
uh, go back to office strategy, and hopefully this time it'll hold. Hopefully this time we won't have another variant that pops up this winter uh, or in the spring that, that kind of curtails that, uh, but certainly we're moving in that direction. By November the 22nd, all federal uh, employees are under a mandate to be vaccinated. And so we continue to work towards that deadline. There's internal milestones that our employees are expected to meet. Um, we're well on track here in Maryland. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that we've got well over 90% of our federal staff out there as NRCS employees uh, who have uh, been vaccinated. Uh, we're working to provide um, proof of vaccination and some other things that we're doing internally but the agency is moving very swiftly towards this November 22nd deadline for all federal uh, employees to be vaccinated. Uh, beyond that, uh, starting in the 1st of December, most of our senior leadership in Washington, our senior execs and other senior leaders across our national headquarters structure in Washington, D.C., will begin to turn to full-time work and will be coming off of uh, maximum government or, or uh, leaving a, a maximum telework status. And so uh, that's uh, really encouraging. And we're really excited to, that these things are starting to move and move in that direction. And we'll be returning to the offices uh, uh, with everyone returning to the offices very soon. Uh, that's for the senior leadership December. Uh, around after the first of the year, probably towards the middle of January, uh, you'll start to see other managers, other supervisors, other people uh, start to return to the office in anticipation of all employees coming back to the office sometime around the March timeframe. Now, of course, all of that is contingent upon what happens with the pandemic, uh, and we don't know what's going to happen. And so we, you know, these things are always fluid, and uh, and certainly, you know, we'll be watching what happens with the pandemic and whether cases kick back up and whether there's calls for concern there. But certainly the current uh, administration is planning for returning everyone back to work and hopefully getting back to a new normal in terms of our course of business. So I would like to just say thanks again to all the partners who continue to work with us on things that we're currently uh, still trying to implement locally. Uh, such as the masking requirements, social distancing requirements, um, the staffing ceilings, and all the other things that you guys have been so cooperative with us on and we've been able to work through uh, as a conservation partnership. Again, it doesn't happen without cooperation and communication. So I just want to say again to all of our districts out there, all of our partners, uh, thanks so much. Uh, next, I just uh, wanted to touch on the budget a little bit. Um, we are operating under a continuing resolution, as most of you probably know. Uh, Congress got together shortly before the end of uh, fiscal year 2021 and signed a continuing resolution uh, that will carry us through December the 3rd. And uh, uh, alluding back to some of Han's uh, comments in terms of the Chesapeake Bay Resiliency uh, Initiative and some of the other things that uh, funding that's being negotiated in Washington, D.C., uh, we'll have to see how some of these things uh, come together. Uh, certainly, uh, if you watch the news, then you know there's a lot of ongoing negotiations and discussion around a pretty big uh, infrastructure uh, bill. We don't know where that's going to fall, uh, but depending on the outcomes of those negotiations and how much funding is in that bill and what priorities uh, that Congress and uh, the administration uh, land on, uh, it could mean that uh, things like the Chesapeake Bay resiliency may get, um, a, a, we may get a bump of funding here in the Chesapeake Bay and, and, and in other places related to conservation. So that'll be something that we'll certainly have to keep our eye on uh, and then work uh, once some of those decisions are made to, to implement here locally. In regard to staffing, I just want to mention again, uh, thanks so much to all the partners out there that have uh, helped us and we've been working alongside of us in terms of uh, hitting all, hitting most of our goals in terms of uh, direct hires this year, back in, I mean, well, in last year, last fiscal year. You know, uh, we, we were all, um, we, we, it's been a journey to say the least in terms of staffing for NRCS and Jen alluded to it a little bit earlier in terms of you know, this is not something that I ever uh, thought that would that I would see as state conservationists here in Maryland would be a time when we would be able to add over 30 staff, field office staff, uh, customer facing field office staff, technical assistance providing staff out there in the field offices in one fiscal year. 
But uh, we were able to achieve that through the hard work of a lot of our uh, leadership team here in uh, the state office and our DCs and other folks out there who really roll up their sleeves and got it done. Uh, you know, I never thought we'd have an opportunity to add 33 staff, but we did request it and we, we received uh, 31 of those positions. And we've onboarded many of those to date and, and we continue to onboard other technicians, civil engineering technicians, uh, various kinds of biologists and specialists out there uh, that are gonna help uh, us support you as the soil conservation districts and those local uh, producers uh, who want to enhance conservation on their farms. So, you know, to add 31 staff in one fiscal year, I think that's, uh, you know, that's great. Uh, but now the real work really does begin. I mean, and it has already started. You know, we're working with you guys as partners to figure out how to get all these folks trained. Fortunately, uh, many of these employees came to us from you guys as partners. And, you know, as we talked about, as our conservation partnership is, is really a plus and a positive, uh, that we have what you might call the back bench of employees who work throughout the partnership who, when they see opportunities within RCS, jump on those opportunities. And they're well prepared to come on with us and to continue the work of uh, getting conservation on the ground. So we still have a lot of training opportunities that we need to take advantage of. We want to continue to work with all of our partners to make sure that we get everyone uh, all the kinds of certifications and job approval authorities and all the kinds of things that these new employees will need uh, to continue to do a good job of um, implementing conservation. So we look forward to that. And certainly we are always uh, a listening ear uh, for opportunities to enhance those efforts. Uh, I do want to announce, and I think I've mentioned it before, but uh, this week is uh, Haysha Cordero's first week as the new assistant state conservationist for programs for NRCS. Uh, she replaced Jackie Baum, who was here for a number of years and worked really done a great job of managing uh, and, and being a steward of all of our financial assistance programs here in the state. So Haysha comes to us from her uh, former position as the district conservationist in Prince George's and Anne Arundel County. And so we're really excited to have um, Haysha on board and in her new position. And this is her first week, her second day. So uh, please uh, wish her well and uh, congratulate her on that accomplishment. And uh, now she gets to come into the state office and become officially a part of the problem. And so uh, I know she's gonna look forward to that. We, we, we appreciate that and uh, we, we appreciate having her on board. Uh, now that she has moved officially into her position, it does uh, present an opportunity uh, to get a new district conservationist in Prince George's and Anne Arundel County. I'm working with Ramon, uh, and Ramon is working diligently to get that position uh, filled with uh, Rob and others on the leadership team. But in uh, as uh, Haitia has come into the state office, Mitch Lemieux, uh, who everyone knows, I think, over, especially in that part of the world, He's a soil conservationist working over there. He's going to step up again and uh, be, be a uh, acting DC for us in Prince George's and Anne Arundel County until we get that position filled permanently. So uh, congratulations to Mitch and thanks for uh, stepping up. And uh, we're going to get that position filled uh, as soon as possible. So uh, let me just finally hit on just a few of the priorities and just offer up some perspective. I think everyone may be aware, but just to remind folks who may not be aware or have not heard, uh, you know, our administration priorities, uh, there's three that they've really centered and focused on, which are climate smart agriculture, urban agriculture, and then also equity, racial, and social justice. And so these are not uh, priorities that are any stranger to anyone in Maryland. These are things that uh, the partnership, conservation partnership in Maryland has worked uh, to make progress on for decades. So it's really not new to us. I think we are all just waiting to hear and see more of the details in terms of what these things look like practically and where are the new opportunities that we can take advantage of uh, to advance these three priorities uh, here in the state of Maryland. And certainly from the standpoint of Climate Smart Ag, there's going to be many, many opportunities uh, to enhance uh, conservation infrastructure here across the state. We're going to be looking to our partners for opportunities where we can, uh, where we don't, where we can uh, share our capacity with our partners' capacity to advance some of these things. So there's going to be new opportunities for agreements and grants along the way. 
And as we find and as we learn more about how these things are actually going to play out in practicality, we certainly will be reaching out to uh, all of our partners, such as MASCD and MDA, for opportunities to do such. You probably heard we got a new RC, R, uh, RCPP in the state uh, through a new component of it uh, called our Alternative Funding Arrangements, AFAs. So we're learning, uh, we're working with those partners that have reached out to us and asked for those that assistance through RCPP, and we'll be working on an agreement with them to see how that's going to play out as we move into the future. From an urban ag uh, perspective, you know, this is a place where we've made a lot of great progress in the state, not just in RCS, but many of you as districts out there, Prince George's County comes to mind, uh, who has uh, worked diligently through NACD. Uh, to enhance uh, our efforts in conservation in urban areas, but we want to even do more. So we're really uh, studying and working with the national office. Uh, you know, we'll see how some of the things play out in the infrastructure bill and what kind of funding priorities come out of that. And we'll be looking, you know, again, once again, to our partners uh, for ways that we can enhance uh, the conservation work and outreach and things that we're doing, um, uh, in, especially in our urban areas. And, and that ties right into that last priority, which is uh, equity, racial, and social justice. Again, uh, many of you are aware that uh, Buddy Bowling, our longtime, so, um, our longtime state outreach coordinator, um, took the opportunity to retire this year. Uh, Buddy was, a, as you guys know, he was an excited, uh, hardworking employee in terms of outreach, dedicated to getting out there and telling people the story of the uh, of NRCS, who we are and what we do and about the conservation partnership in Maryland. Uh, he's retired now and we're taking that as an opportunity to kind of look across the, uh, the landscape and see how we want to handle outreach as we go forward. Uh, you know, how do, what does that look like within NRCS uh, as a federal agency, but also how does that line up uh, with our partners' uh, objectives and goals as it relates to outreach in the local areas across the whole state. So. We're having some internal dialogue about that right now. We certainly will be uh, continue to engage uh, all of our partners in terms of that those questions, especially um, many of our partners in our urban areas. So we'll be definitely reaching out to people like Steve Darcy and uh, our folks in Baltimore and other uh, of our urban areas to see if there's uh, new opportunities for us to work together to enhance uh, not only urban ag, but outreach at large uh, for new and beginning farmers, for underserved clientele, all the things uh, that the administration is expecting us to do uh, in regard to these three priorities. So I'll leave it there. And uh, I'm certainly here and um, opportunities uh, to ask questions. I'll, I'll answer questions or uh, address any other concerns, but I'll close just by saying again, thanks so much for the partnership and thanks for the opportunity to uh, work with you guys to enhance conservation across the state. Thank you, Dr. Hilsman. Any questions for Dr. Hilsman? Okay. Bruce, I, is there Bruce, a I have a question. Oh, absolutely, John. So, so one thing, one thing about uh, that's important about uh, the, the kind of the urban agricultural initiatives, um, Dr. Hilsman, is that we have to be cognizant of the fact of what type, types of um, barriers exist in those urban areas, particularly when it comes to things like agriculture use assessment and how that impacts um, those urban agriculture operations to be able to conduct their businesses. Um, we run into issues, for instance, just in Montgomery County, um, if a property is, is being farmed, but it is residentially assessed, uh, even for simple as, something as simple as a high tunnel requires them to get a building permit. But if that property was assessed for agriculture, they would be exempt in the county from attaining things, uh, for attaining a building permit for even something like a high tunnel. So those, I know that most of the NRC folks that we have work and they don't really understand kind of nuances of those local ordinances. So I think at some point it'd be good to sort of figure out maybe a checklist or something that we could help develop to sort of address what those impediments may be uh, to sort of help facilitate um, those operations in, in, in urban areas. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, John. And it's certainly something that, um, you know, our NRCS folks that work with you there locally uh, have raised some of those issues and concerns, maybe some of those they're not as familiar with, uh, but they've also raised a whole host of other kinds of concerns that we've been trying to figure out how to get by, uh, especially at the national level. When I was most uh, recently on detail in national headquarters, this is something that we talked about daily 
uh, in terms of how, for example, just economies of scale in urban areas and, and the pure small nature of the small farm operations uh, in urban areas, things like our payment schedules don't always line up with that very well. Sometimes it costs a lot more to do conservation in these areas, even at a smaller scale than what uh, it does. It just doesn't uh, add up in terms of our payment schedules and some other things that we, uh, some of the tools that we use uh, for conservation. So there's a there's a whole host of things, and certainly we're going to be. That's why I said we we've got to engage with people like yourself, uh, Steve Darcy's, and uh, others in Baltimore County and other urban areas around the state. Uh, just to make sure we're aware of all the kinds of challenges and barriers that are out there and then try to find ways to um, uh, to accommodate those producers who are trying to do agriculture and conservation and uh, on on a smaller scale. So so thanks for that. OK, any other questions? All right. Is there someone on for State Soil Conservation Committee? Yes, this is Van. Deal. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be uh, short, uh, not a whole lot of uh, updates today, but uh, I will say that since our last uh, MASCD meeting, uh, we've the committee has appointed seven uh, new appointments to uh, the different boards throughout the state. Uh, in our October, I'm sorry, our September meeting, uh, we did have a presentation and discussion uh, from MDA about max flat, uh, flat rate structures. Uh, and you know the, the impacts that we've all the districts have seen uh, throughout the pandemic, and and what Max has done to try to address some of the the deficiencies in, in costs and, and materials. Uh, we also discussed uh, and had a presentation from uh, Dr. Kate Everts uh, from the Harry R. Hughes uh, Center for Agroecology on the climate vulnerability assessment for Maryland agriculture. Uh, so uh, again, a great discussion uh, uh, from Dr. Everts. Uh, on their efforts. In uh, October, we had speakers discuss uh, different from different funding sources, grants that are available to districts. Uh, we had Sarah Kozer from Chesapeake Bay Trust, uh, Gabe Coey from DNR, the Chesapeake and Atlantic Coastal Bays Trust Fund, and Stephanie Heidbreder from National uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So there are lots of sources out there of, of funds uh, and lots of opportunities for districts. Uh, so I think it was really good to hear from those different resources on what's out there, what are some of the timeframes and how districts could take advantage of those. Uh, so if you, uh, that was just held at our most recent meeting. So if there's any questions about grant resources, I believe Alicia sent out uh, the slides and also the contact information for each of those different agencies. Uh, following uh, our last board, uh, state committee meeting. Uh, we also uh, had a, a brief discussion on our training plan for sexual harassment prevention. Uh, Alicia and Byron have been uh, offered a uh, sexual harassment training at the last MASCD meeting in Cambridge. Uh, the goal was to try to get every uh, supervisor in the state to attend those trainings. Uh, there will be uh, some regional trainings provided in mid to end February to try to get closer to the, the supervisors to provide that training. Uh, Alicia will be sending out those dates specifically and, and locations uh, very soon. Uh, but we just I would hope that uh, all the board members and supervisors throughout the state uh, make the effort to attend uh, that training to. to I think there's always an opportunity to learn and and uh, from a supervisor level to gain more information. Uh, we, we think we it's common sense. But I think what I have found is that there are lots of uh, things that I just figured that you know, we all know and take for granted. Uh, maybe we, we need a little touch up training on, on some of those things. Uh, looking forward, uh, our next meeting, we are still setting the agenda at this point. Uh, but we're, we may talk or have some updates on the MOU uh, with state historic preservation agencies and staff responsibilities from NRCS's perspective. Um, or you know, we may also uh, get an update on soil health programs, but we're still setting the schedule for November. So keep an eye out for uh, that to be uh, sent out soon. 
And then, of course, December will be our, our work planning session for 2022. Uh, it's hard to believe that 2021 is coming to an end and 2022 is is uh, about to arrive, but we're, we're at that point. Uh, so we want to try to chart you know, what, what are the topics of interest to all the districts uh, that we can uh, pull up for discussion, uh, whether that's presentations, discussions, uh, as we go through 2022. So uh, please keep that in mind for the state committee meeting in December to have some idea, come prepared with some ideas for topics uh, for the next year, because we want to make sure that we're providing information and, and talking about things that everyone else is interested in, uh, not just from our perspective. Uh, so with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Bruce, unless there are any questions. Van and State Committee. Thank you, Van. Uh, it's my turn now. Bear with me for a second here. Okay. Uh, President's report. The 2022 MASCD annual meeting, this is next year. An NACD Northeast Regional Meeting will be held on August 28th through the 31st at the Hyatt in Cambridge. We're working with the NACD Northeast Region to combine both meetings into a single event. The agenda will include the updates and meetings that are important to the Maryland Partnership and also highlight innovative programs and projects from other states in the Northeast Region. The 2021 Northeast Region Meeting is coming up next week and we'll follow up with a survey to understand the issues or projects that our districts would like to learn more about. And as Van alluded to, MDA will be offering a series of sexual harassment prevention training workshops for supervisors in February. The dates and locations will be announced shortly, but the workshops are required and will be offered in person throughout the state. This training is mandatory for a reason. It's important for all of us to recognize and address a toxic working environment for our district's employees but it's also our responsibility to know what actions to take if we are to receive a comp complaint. Keep an eye out for the trainings and MASCD will be coordinating with state committee to follow up with additional information for everyone. I wanna just really urge the supervisors and directors to really make the effort to attend this. I think it's a very important um, workshop and training. And I can tell you from personal um, re issues with that, um violating confidentiality toxic workplace just nothing gets done and that's we want to get conservation on the ground so look those uh trainings we're also working on several resources for district supervisors and district managers the mascd work website has gotten a facelift which includes a new page with resources for districts there you can find samples of annual work plans long-range strategic plans policies and procedures, resources for diversity, equity, and inclusion, employee manuals, and other resources. We're also working on developing new resources for district managers as well. Following up on discussion at the MASCD annual meeting, Jen and Alicia are coordinating a series of quarterly calls for managers to share strategies and ideas on a variety of different topics. The first of these meetings was held last Monday and was focused on annual work plans. They had really good feedback on this first call and are looking at developing new resources and ways to share expertise between districts. MASCD work with individual districts to host a series of regional meetings to discuss small pond reviews earlier this month. As you all read, NRCS is focusing their resources on agricultural ponds and the districts are working through options to continue to offer these reviews for our stakeholders. There was a good discussion between the districts and MDE, NRCS, and MDA at the meetings about the workload and capacity in each county. MASCD is still working with MDE to answer questions related to liability and charging for services. We're also putting together resources to support the districts and their decisions on how to proceed, which Jen will outline later on in today's meeting. That's my report, unless there's any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, NACD update, Frank Richardson or Lee McDaniel? Yeah, um, Bruce, can you hear me? Bruce, yes. can you hear me? Yes, we, yes, we can. Okay. Um, 
uh, let me touch on a couple things. Meet in-person meetings coming up. Uh, the NACD Northeast uh, meeting will be held in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, next week, October 31st through November 3rd. And the significance here is uh, they are also combining this uh, along with their state meeting. So it'll be similar to what we're planning on doing uh, next August. So I'll be sure to bring, this, bring that uh, agenda back home. Uh, also, uh, the NACD winter meetings uh, will be held in uh, Orlando, Florida, February 12th through February 16th, assuming COVID is not an issue. <laughs> uh, we've been um, also having uh, many meetings by Zoom and uh, one significant one is I'd like to touch on is is the uh, health insurance um, program is kind of up and running in the first stages. It's uh, just for straight health insurance. Uh, you can uh, go to their website. Go to the website, which I'll give you right now. It's NACD dot mercer m e r c e r indigo i n d i g o dot com and you can go to that portal and uh, uh, look at the different uh, companies and what their their um, prices are and, and check that out um, um, one thing about was asked in one of the meetings was if a supervisor is on has, has this insurance as and then goes off the board would he lose the insurance and right now the question the, the answer would be he would not lose the insurance but they may have to change things from a group program to an individual program uh, let's see what else I got here I think that's that's all all I have right now. Um, I, mean, I can tell you more after I get back from Portsmouth. I was interested if there is somebody else or anybody else going to the Portsmouth New Hampshire meeting. This is Jen Nelson. There. Who was that? Uh, Jen Nelson. I'll be going. Okay. Good. I won't be the only one there. <laughs> That's all I have. I'm willing to answer any questions if I can. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Any questions for uh, Frank on NACD? Bruce, right. I'd like to. Uh, this is Lee. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, just wanted to mention that the Northeast region has a new representative, Annika McGurk from Maine. Oh, yeah. And the the background information on that is that position's always been in the D.C. office, and we were the only, well, D.C. is part of the Northeast, so that kind of made sense, but it was the only region where uh, the representative was in the D.C. office, so now um, the representative will actually be still 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 in the region, but not in D.C., where, the, where it wasn't very cost-effective to have an employee. So hopefully um, there won't be as much turnover now that we have somebody out away from D.C. At least that's the hope, I think, and uh, maybe more cost effective, too. So uh, I haven't met her, but I guess uh, Frank will get to meet her up in New Hampshire next week. That's all. All right. Great. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Frank. Uh, University okay. of Maryland. University of Maryland Extension. Darren. Is Darren on or anybody for University of Maryland? Actually, I I did hear from Darren that he has a conflict this morning um, with 
I think two other meetings, um, but he is really good about getting updates to us. And when I get that, I will add that to the Google Drive folder. Okay, great, thank you. Any other old business reports? Okay, if not, uh, we will go on into new business, 2022 winter meeting. I can start off on that one. Um, we have a tentative date set. It was on the first page of the agenda uh, or the announcement for this, um, where we're looking at um, February 9th and 10th uh, of next year. And so we've set a meeting with um, Charlotte and Mike Mason, um, Charlotte from Rural Development, um, to coordinate on some of the logistics um, for that and to get an update. I, I don't think that there have been any plans on how they're going to handle session next year, at least not firm ones, to know, um, you know, if the buildings are open to be able to have a, a luncheon in uh, where we usually have it. Um, so we're, we're still trying to find out some of those um, logistical details to see how we can have an in-person meeting um, and, and make that work. So stay tuned for uh, some additional details on that. We're trying to pull that meeting together uh, to coordinate some of those, but you can mark your calendars for the 9th and 10th uh, right now. Okay, 9th and 10th of February, everybody. Mark your calendars. Thanks, Jen. Uh, 2022 annual meeting. This is the Upper Shore uh, hosting this. Yep. And so I saw Tony's on. Um, I can start if that's okay. Um, and then let anyone from the Upper Shore, I'm looking out to see who else is on. Um, I can let them fill in. Um, as as they they'd like to um so that we have met uh the upper shore and um uh, missy and myself to start planning um and to get a sense of when we could have it and so that I, we talked a little bit before the meeting started today um but we had landed on the dates for august 28th to 31st um basically the to have the the meeting at the Hyatt in Cambridge, they were available to host us for the last two weeks of August and uh, the very last week. The dates that we ended up landing on were the ones um, that were within our budget um, for for people to come out and stay. So um, that made it fairly easy to select a date um, because if we were going to have it at that location, that's what we were looking at. And so we're working on. Uh, developing an agenda now. I've framed out um, what it might look like to combine the MASCD and the NACD annual meetings and send it over to, to the Hyatt. Uh, and they've returned a draft contract for us to review uh, and, and get signed and sent back to them. Um, and so uh, uh, Missy and I have also had the pleasure of meeting uh, virtually, at least with Annika, to start talking about the meeting from NACD's perspective. And um, uh, we've also talked with uh, Denise Savageau, um, you know, just to get a sense since Missy and I are both new to uh, to the Northeast region meetings, just to, to understand how the, the meetings flow and, and how we can put those together basically in a way that provides um, additional value for everyone attending from Maryland um, by highlighting um, um, projects and, and programs uh, that are, are relevant from other states um, and also show uh, some of the other states in the region, you know, highlights for the Chesapeake and, and so forth. So, um, so yeah, that's about where we're at. We're going to have the Northeast region has their meeting next week, which you know, I mentioned I'll be attending uh, with Frank. And so We'll get one uh, example of how that meeting usually goes and get to meet some other people from, from the, meet, the region. Um, I think we're going to follow up with a survey to everyone here and some of the other states to get a, a interest in different topics and um, uh, sessions that we can put together 
So be on the lookout for that after the meeting is over. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there to start uh, adding some some details and, and specific topics uh, to that agenda. So that's coming along quickly. Um, and uh, with that, I'll I'll stop to see if anyone from the Upper Shore has anything to add, or if anyone has any questions. And this is Karen. All last fall, we discussed that there may be help needed in other districts, even though it's an upper shore um, hosting it. Since mm -hmm. we're going to have the the area, um, the northeast area, some of the other districts may be asked to send some personnel people to help with logistics. Um. Yep. And so I think that's a really good point. Um, and that's something if if there are other districts that are able to help out, I think maybe what we should do after the Northeast region meeting is circle up and identify where those needs are, where the, the additional needs and gaps are. Um, and then we, I think we're in a better position to reach out and know what we wanna ask for. Does that make sense? Yep, it makes sense. Up, up for. I'm sorry, what? Say any anybody else from the upper shore. <clears throat> any other questions? or comments? Okay. Um, moving on. Is there any other new business? Bruce, I do see since you're looking uh, or you're calling in, I did add a, a note here for the sexual harassment prevention training, but I don't think that we have any additional updates at this time beyond what you and Van had talked about earlier. Okay, that's fine. We'll we have some time. It's not until February, and we'll we'll touch base on it again at the end and winter meeting, and possibly if we get up to state committee, we'll forward that on. So. Unless there's any other new business, I'll move into other business. And the first item is MASCD 2022 budget. Okay. So I can take the first look at this. Does that that make sense? I just have to find it. Yes, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> just a minute. Um on a single computer today, and I'm used to having more than one screen. Let's see, okay, so I think this is the one that I want. All right, so it's small, but can everybody see what I have for the budget? And then I'll zoom in here. Nope, too big. Let me try that again. Not too big. Not no, too it's big. Here. Okay. It's oh, I see. Uh, part. Thank you for saying something. Um, my go-to meeting is covering part of my um, part of my screen, but I have it in front of me too, so I can I can make this work. So basically, um, we are revisiting this after the annual meeting. Um, because for a couple of reasons. Um, the first was that we were looking at um, an older budget that um, I needed to give everybody time to review uh, a correct one. And then um, we had also had a question uh, related to the financial review, um, which had been completed and made available uh, for, for everyone's review ahead of this meeting. Um, so with those two questions uh, out there, we decided to come back and revisit the budget um, at this meeting. So I have our 2021 proposed versus actual and then our 2022 proposed budget as well. 
And so one of the things that I do want to uh, get to, we can go over this as it is right now. Um, I, hopefully everybody's had a chance to review it. Um, but I do want to have a discussion and bring to everybody's attention um, something that I'd like your feedback and input on, which is, is MASCD's current reliance on uh, grant income. And so what I have here for the budget um, doesn't change very much this year. Um, so this uh, is pretty straightforward uh, based on what we've had from previous years. Uh, and what I anticipate we have uh, for 2022. But what I, I'd like to talk about after this is um, what we would look at in 23 and, and going forward from there. So for this next year, uh, we're looking at $52,050 in dues and about $10,000 in meeting income. Um, we're anticipating uh, grant funding from NIFWIF and the Campbell Foundation uh, for 45000 and 35000 We have 220000 in uh, an NRCS cooperative agreement, 100000 in the engineering technical assistance grants. Uh, and then we're also looking at some pass-through funds related to what we've done in recent years uh, with 21125 for the MPT, Maryland Farm and Harvest Program. Bit, John. Teacher. Hmm? Scroll down a bit. Scroll down a bit? Okay, thanks. Come on. Thank you, thank you. Okay, yep. This is my trouble with looking at a paper and, and not paying attention to the screen there. But our total anticipated income or estimated income for this year will be uh, 483,215. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Now you can see it. And then on the expense side, um, you can see we've got uh, $4,000 for accounting. We've got uh, an annual report, uh, charitable registration, uh, contractors that includes Marguerite, Missy and myself. Uh, we don't have a, a program assistant um, per se, um, like Lindsay did. So that line is in there for 2021, um, but that's kind of rolled in um, to, to my contract, but we have uh, government relations, which is Providence, um, as a new line item. Okay. Uh, we have miscellaneous items in there. Um, so FFA grants. I'm going to skip down a little bit, unless anybody has any questions here. Um, so I'm going to skip down, I think, to travel. Uh, just because I wanted to explain that a little bit. Um, so for MASCD contractors, um, uh, where I got that figure of $8,000 is that splitting four meetings a year with uh, Delaware. And so I typically attend the NACD annual meeting, um, the Northeast region meeting, the uh, summer meeting, or Soil and Water Conservation Society um, annual conference and something else that is escaping me right now. Executive. Oh, the Executive Directors Conference. Thanks, Missy. Um, so those four uh, events and then uh, those would be split with Delaware and then uh, mileage going to and from Annapolis for, for various meetings and around the state. Um, so that's where we came up with the estimate there. Um, other things have remained pretty consistent from year to year. Let's see. So we've got grant expenses that are tied to the income sources um, above. And then there's the pastor again on the expense side. And so this year we're showing a um, an anticipated loss of uh, $11,210. And that's due because uh, we operate on a cash basis. And so we received a $14,000 grant um, that was reflected in our income last year that will be transferred over and, and paid out this year. So um, we're, we're really not in the red, um, but it, it looks that way. So that's what we have for uh, the proposed budget for 2022, okay. Are there any questions on this part?
Okay. So the other thing that I wanted to look through, and, and Bruce and I had had um, a few conversations about this, um, they, that one of the challenges uh, in my first year as I've come on board with MASED um, is, is our reliance on grants. So um, I work on a number of, of activities that support <coughs> the organization. I think that everybody agrees are really important. Um, and those are include things like uh, keeping up on um, the legislative session alongside of Providence strategies, uh, working on the annual report and district highlights, the website and social media, um, and representing MASCD at different ag and environment meetings. So we're, there's an advocacy piece there that we work on. Um, there's also a partnership building piece um, that include uh, as a liaison with uh, MDA, state committee, NRCS, FSA meetings, um, the NACD meetings I mentioned earlier, coordinating with individual districts and regions like the small ponds meetings, and also just program administration. So uh, communicating with Bruce and the executive committee, uh, working on uh, the meeting planning for this this board meeting or winter meetings, the annual meetings, um, coordinating with the other contractors for MASCD, reviewing the budget, um, and coordinating with MASCD's committees and, and applying for grants and coordinating agreements. And so those are all activities that are kind of outside of um, the, the grant income. Now, as you heard me talking earlier, we also have uh, six grants that we're running. Um, or that we're administering right now. And they require varying levels of, of time commitment. Uh, some of them not so much, and some of them take up quite a bit of time. And what I'm finding, um, honestly, is that I am working on prioritizing um, items in that former category to make sure that I'm supporting the organization and the districts. Uh, and where I'm running short on time is um, in implementing and executing the, the activities that we've outlined in our grants. And so what I would like to uh, propose uh, for the board to consider is looking at alternatives um, uh, to, to grant funding um, to displace some of that funding um, in future years. Instead of taking on more grant projects um, that I, I'm finding that it's difficult to carve out time for uh, that we pursue other options. And so I, I put together this second spreadsheet that looks at what our current reliance is on grants and some op opportunities or, or options uh, for the board to consider. Okay. Let's see. So um, right now, we have $54,000, give or take, in dues uh, and $10,000 in meeting income. So I was looking at potentially we can look at increasing dues uh, for all of the districts, or we can look at considering a sliding scale for districts based on population or other criteria. Um, and so I, there are some other states that do that, I know, and I can reach out to them to find out what sort of formulas or criteria they use there. Um, but that's one place. Um, if we increase dues by an average of $1,000 per year per district, which I know is, is considerable, um, but I'm, I'm looking at a number of options that kind of make the, the numbers work out, basically. We can also look at increasing meeting income. So uh, we made $10,000 uh, on our annual meeting this year, we can spread that out over multiple meetings, but if we can look at increasing that meeting income by $15,000 through sponsorships and increased meeting fees, that's an option. Um, I would recommend that we continue to seek some grant funding, just maybe something that's more in line with uh, the time that I have available that Missy and Marguerite and I have available to work on those items. be here and then scoot down from there okay so then on the expense side uh, there's uh, an opportunity to save some money uh, by working with a, a less expensive accounting firm um, 
Let's see. There's a little bit of an opportunity to save some funding uh, with the partnership press going virtual. And then the other question that I have is looking at the, the pass through funds for Maryland Farm and Harvest. Um, the districts are spending about $21,000 a year in pass through funds to support that program, um, which is important. But if we are looking at potentially evaluating different priorities, then that was uh, one potential place to look. And so with that, um, right now, our current reliance on grants um, is close to $40,000. Um, and I'd like to get that to be somewhere closer to about 15,000 in order to, to match up with the, the time that's available to devote to working on grants. And so um, this is just one set of options that I'd put together between increasing dues, increasing meeting income, and looking for places to cut some funding or um, cut some expenses um, to uh, make that work out. So that was, I'm not looking to make any changes next year in this, this next year for the budget, um, but I would like the board to consider some opportunities uh, moving forward on how we can reduce reliance on grants. And so these are a few options that we put together, but I'd like to get your feedback and input on what that budget should look like going forward. Jen. Um, yes, Bruce. This is Bruce. What? When was the last time uh, dues were increased for MASCD membership? Okay. Um, they've actually been increase um, a fair, fairly regularly. Um, let me pull up something else. I had put this together in kind of a presentation format and then I just walked through it, but the last slide does have, um, the last slide does have a, a history. So the last time the dues were raised uh, was 2019. Okay. Um, but I think so it would be helpful to kind of bring this up. And And how much were they? I don't have access to seeing that screen, unfortunately. Yeah. How, how much how much were they increased in 19? No, I'm getting ready to, to walk through that right now. Come on. OK. So here's what we have. And Marguerite, if she's still on, I have a feeling she knows this off the top of her head. Um, Again, this is partly hidden by my own go-to meeting, but it looks like they were increased from 2000 to the 22 or 2250 that they are right now. Um, so you guys, it, you started charging dues in 1996 and they've been increased um, seven times, I think since then. Not that I'm not implying we increased dues. That was just a question. Right. Um, looking at the options there, I, I like the option of a sponsor of sponsorships perhaps with vendors at our, our summer meeting uh as nacd does mm -hmm. i'm torn right now and not a big fan of affiliate memberships okay um, unless we spell out what an affiliate membership is i don't want to get into any type of commitments to a non-membership group uh, if possible, um, but I like the idea of the sponsorships in a uh, um, for, um, I, I like the uh, Maryland Farm and Harvest sponsorship, um, but that can be looked at. The CPA is that for our compilation? It's uh, the financial review, the 990. Um, is what we've been going over in just the past few months. Okay, that's you know that's not going to be a large savings. And shopping CPAs is, I know from our own district, that's that's not a big savings. I'm always somewhat um, surprised at the cost, but it's it, it is what it is. Um, so that's that's all. It I is a couple. I think, I mean, it's it's 4,000 currently, and we're looking at other firms um, that would come in at about 1,500. 
Right. Yeah. It's not a huge part and of the budget, but it's a big part no, of but that. It's a, it's line too, and, and I appreciate looking into that because that is a, you know, that's always a question on my mind locally uh, because the, the format that they're required to follow for uh, those financials is, is standardized. So it's just, it's just the fee is not, it's not standardized. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we can definitely look at um, the, you know, into sponsorships um, for annual meetings. Um, given, and, and like I said, I, I am looking at continuing to pursue some grant opportunities, um, just given how, um, how big the change is, um, I think we need to be looking at some kind of all of the above uh, approach to, to making this balance out. So is there any interest in me working with other states to find out about what their dues look like or their due structure, particularly in states that have a sliding scale? Oh, I, I think we should look into that. I also think, you know, also ask those various states if there is any capital budget items that, that help them as an mm -hmm. organization. They <laughs> But yeah, I think I think that you know we can mirror some of those um, those issues. Okay. Bruce, this is Lee. Would it make sense for you to put a small committee together to work with Jen uh, to look at various options? I mean, it sounds like we got another year because we got this year's budget we're going to act on. I think shortly. Um, would that make any sense to put a group together to help Jen out a little bit and and maybe get into more detail than the board can get into? Absolutely. Absolutely. That sounds good. <coughs> looks like we have looks like we have options. It's nice we we have options. <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of times we do. But um you know, there's several options in here that I really like, but I, that's a good idea, Lee. I would I, let's put together a committee to review this and come up with things. Okay. Great. And so we can revisit. Oh, go ahead. When, when when can we revisit this? Um. We can see how it goes with a small committee to see if it's something that can go on the agenda for either the winter meeting um, or the well, March board meeting. Uh, yeah, let's if we can maybe March even um, if we have that much time simply because of a packed agenda in the winter. But that's either one. Okay. No, nope, March is right. seems like a good timeline to me. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for for putting that together and, and looking at these options. I appreciate that. There's it's good. As I said, it's good we have. Yeah, thank you for everybody's other, attention. On that. Any other questions or comments on this at, at the time? Can come back. Here's our our 2022 budget that I don't think we officially passed at the summer Correct. meeting. Correct. Any questions or comments on our 2022 budget, which basically is a break even, a little bit, $3,000 um, in the black. Is there any comments or questions on that? Uh, if there are not, I, I'd entertain a motion to accept the budget as presented for 2022. Uh, you might want to mute yourself. 
Is there any, um, does anybody like to entertain a motion on the 2022 budget? I'll entertain a motion, Mike, from Baltimore County. Thanks, Mike. I'll Is there second. a second? Second All right. from Tommy. All, the, All right, thanks, Tommy. All those opposed to approving the 2022 budget as presented signify by saying aye. Okay, the budget's approved as presented. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Small pond meeting is update. Okay. Let me bring up um, the summary from that that I put together. Oh, here we go. Okay. So let me go up to the top here. Shoo. Okay. So as everybody's familiar with, uh, MASCD coordinated a series of regional meetings in this past month to discuss small pond reviews. Um, so NRCS is, is looking to focus on their services uh, as they relate to agricultural ponds. And so the districts are, are working on options um, and decisions, basically, whether or not to continue offering services on non-ag ponds. And so uh, we had met to, uh, in the southern region, the eastern shore, and the central and western regions um, to identify information needs and resources and other challenges, and also to share knowledge and identify preferred options. So I had put this summary together and hadn't shared it out with everybody yet because I had sent it over to MDE to make sure that I hadn't missed anything, um, if they had anything to include. And I haven't heard back from them yet. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the Google Drive folder for everyone to review. And if I get any updates uh, from MDE uh, for additional resources or, or any corrections or anything like that, then I will go ahead and, and let everyone know. Um, but I put together a section uh, where I compiled notes for from all the spawn, small pond meetings. Um, there's a section at the end that includes the notes from each of those individual meetings. Um, but there were, I divided this into a couple of parts. So uh, first, uh, issues around capacity uh, for uh, the districts to conduct reviews. Um, then I looked at uh, issues around liability and issues around expertise and authority to provide uh, reviews and approvals. I'll go back up to the top to go through these in a little more detail after I outline everything. And then there were uh, some discussions on other issues as well. And then the next steps um, includes the summary of developing and sharing resources. Uh, and I have some links to some of the resources that we've identified so far. So I'm going to go back up to the top now to talk a little bit about the challenges that we have um, in these three sections uh, around capacity, liability, and expertise and authority. So let's see. Okay, so um, the workload from the small pond review request is variable around the state. So some engineer or some districts have an engineer on staff that can handle re the reviews, uh, some contract with an engineer or have an arrangement with the county, but several uh, currently rely on an NRCS. Uh, to supply these reviews. Um, there was a note that the workload is likely to increase as aging projects require retrofits and some issues related to climate change that might uh, result in uh, more uh, frequent extreme weather events. Um, so if many counties opt to refer, refer those small pond reviews back to NDE's dam safety permit, um, uh, MDE also has limited capacity, and so a long wait for permits um, uh, reflects poorly on all the partners. And there, it was mentioned a couple of times that if the manageable, if the workload for MDE becomes unmanageable, uh, that that might spur new regulations that impact the districts as well. So kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, so the draft MOU with MDE contains provisions for construction inspections, um, which the districts noted that they, they don't have the capacity to do those uh, inspections either. 
Um, so you'll see I have a highlighted question for MDE that I haven't gotten an answer back yet, um, but uh, related to do the districts have the authority to charge uh, for these reviews? Okay. Um, so some potential solutions in this arena for capacity. Uh, so the districts, I think the, the MOU is intended to kind of help with this capacity question. Um, but I, but again, the questions that are out to MDE right now are, um, what are the implications if the MOU is revised? What kind of problems specifically uh, is the MOU intended to solve? Um, what if it's not in place by January 1st? Um, so MDE had mentioned that they want to avoid three-way MOUs that include the county um, because uh, how it would extend the timeline to develop those. Um, but some districts were in support of, of waiting uh, to make sure that um, the right MOU, I'd say, was in place the first time. Uh, so there's a, an option to hire an engineer. Some districts are looking into that either within their own district or on a regional basis that would include costs uh, for that within the county fee schedule. Um, and there's also the option of pursuing an agreement with the county conduct, to conduct reviews, um, which is um, kind of the, the go-to strategy on the Eastern shore. So another way to potentially address capacity issues is to refer those small pond reviews back to MDE. And to that, MDE is looking at other options to approve uh, small ponds where needed, um, by, maybe by uh, working on an agreement with the county, but it's gonna take time because that involves a change in regulation where currently the districts are the only ones who are granted the authority to approve uh, small pond reviews. Um, there's also a potential, it was mentioned in one district, to route small pond approvals through the expedited reviewer program at MDE, which is currently in, in a different division, but has some potential. Um, and then in at least one of the meetings, I know Jaquay uh, mentioned that NRCS might be available to provide assistance on a case-by-case -case basis. So I can pause there to see if anybody hey, has any questions. Yep. I don't. So just a couple things that I observed, too, when we talk about uh, some of the districts, uh, particularly mm -hmm. that are using um, um, NRCS retired engineers, uh, one of the points that came out in part of the discussion is on January 1st, those engineers lose their job approval authority. So yeah. even those folks that are working under the environment where you have an engineer on staff that's a retired NRCS individual, um, that job approval authority disappears on January 1st. Yep, we are we are getting to that. Um, yeah, but you are sorry, absolutely right. No, no, it's just uh, I, I put that in a different section, but you're right. Absolutely. And then the other um, thing is the other yeah. thing is that, that that comes in is is also in terms of. Um, I think it was also outlined as a, as a potential challenge is if we don't have NRCS engineers that are retired that can do this work. You know, it's almost like you've got cannibalism using these local engineers because these engineers that are involved in these stormwater projects are the designers and they can't be the designers, reviewers and approvers, even if the district tried to you know, tap into that resource, which means it's potential that districts would have to have kind of like agreements with a multitude of engineering firms just to be uh, that you don't have this cross pollination between uh, project design, review and approve. Correct. Yep, and and so if uh, some of these other questions can be answered and it is um, feasible for the districts to contract these services, then you're right um, that they would need to look at contracting with um, at least two firms. Uh, and it was Elmer who brought this to my attention um, for that reason, you know, so that you would have one that does the design um, that can't also be the firm that does the review. So, yep, um, that would be an issue that needs addressed as well. Um, the liability question, uh, those are all questions for MDE. And again, I haven't heard back from them, so I can't really speak to that, but uh, we still have uh, some questions around the how the protection for the districts works, whether they have someone on staff or contract out uh, these services or work with someone at the county. Um, but within uh, the expertise and authority 
uh, within that realm. Uh, again, some of the challenges, we have the, the implications of NRCS removing job approval authority uh, for engineers. Um, there, there's a lack of clarity around that. Um, we've also looked at uh, where the county can do reviews, um, but MDE pointed out that sometimes they're really familiar with stormwater uh, reviews, but not so much with small pond reviews. And so we need to make sure that people have expertise in small ponds um, in order to do those reviews. Um, and then it also came up that the districts themselves, it, as the approval authority, may, may not have the expertise and familiarity with the project to approve a third party review. And there was some, some discomfort around that. Um, and so some potential solutions there were to develop and share resources. Um, we've, we've got some of those identified below, things like checklists um, um, and, and things like that. Um, so NDE is also working on developing a state level 378 standard um, and has started to offer uh, training workshops. And I know Jaque mentioned that NRCS can also assist with training uh, as long as the 378 standard continues to be referenced in Comar. So there's um, a need for, and it sounds like partners are working on developing uh, new training opportunities to make sure that everyone is up to speed on what's involved in these reviews. See. And then some of the other issues oh, 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 too far. Sorry. Um, that came up uh, were around as built. Um, the, the districts have uh, some difficulty in receiving as built from contractors, especially with retrofits. Um, and they're not currently certified. So there were a couple of, of options that were considered there um, around that particular issue. And in the central and western region, uh, there was also some discussion about the cold water U3 watersheds um, and that the definition is too broad and we, how um, the districts really need a defined process um, for those reviews um, so that they can make an informed decision on whether or not to offer those. Let's see. And so for next steps, uh, obviously, I'm still waiting on uh, some answers from MDE that are, are really important um, for identifying the next steps to move forward. Um, but this is the summary uh, for all three meetings that was put together. Uh, let me move my go to meeting window so that I can see what I have written here. Um, sharing a draft policies and procedures document that John Roche mentioned. Uh, for as-built inspections and an as-built checklist. Um, MASCD is working on developing a draft procurement agreement with liability language that was mentioned, uh, that was a resolution actually at the MASCD annual meeting. Um, so as long as we can come up with something that it appears that that helps or, or helps to solve a problem, um, I will definitely be moving forward with that. Um, and looking at developing a statewide uniform pond approval checklist. Um, uh, MDE, as I understand it, is working on revising that draft MOU, and I'm waiting for an expected timeline on what that looks like as well. Um, let's see, answering questions. Uh, we're looking at setting an update meeting with MDE before the end of the year so that we can, everyone will have access to the information on how these three regional meetings went, um, and that way, we can, once we have answers from MDE on some of those questions that were listed above, uh, that we can circle back up um, to, to confirm those and, and make sure everybody has all the answers that they need. Um, and here's the update at the, the board of directors meeting. So some of the uh, resources that had been identified so far uh, that I wanted to make available, I think we can add to this list um, is, a uh, I know on MDE's website, they have a small pond work group interest form. It looks like they're, they're working on pulling together a group uh, to address this issue. Uh, they had mentioned uh, the regulation on cold water and use three methodology, which I have available. Uh, they had a section on, MDE has a section on their website uh, related to resources on the dam safety website, um, a list of preferred contractors, 
um, which which we do have available. I don't have it linked here. Um, this might be an older version that I'm looking at right now. And then also uh, they have recorded the 378 training sessions MDE had uh, that they had held earlier this year. And so um, I wanted to confirm the link that I have the right link with them, um, but I'll definitely share those out as well. And so, um, as I mentioned, there are also um, uh, notes from the individual meetings after this part, if anybody is interested in going through and just uh, reviewing uh, the discussion, the highlights from the discussions from any of the other meetings as well. So that is the update that I have here uh, for the small pond review meetings, or yes, small pond review regional meetings. Are there any questions? Jan, this is Bruce from St. Mary's. Uh, one of the items that was discussed was with NRCS no longer doing the small pond review and assisting the districts, uh, that the Maryland 378 standards and specification uh, will not or no longer be uh, utilized and that the Maryland Department of the Environment was going to develop their own standard and specifications uh, and then get Comar switched. So when we're talking about trying to come up with uniform policy and review, that's going to be hard because everything we have is based on that Maryland 378 and the new standard and spec that MDE will be working on is an unknown as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. No, nope. um, and that is a good point. That was mentioned, I think, at all three meetings that MDE is working on moving forward with that state level. 378 standard and the implications of that um, are a little bit unclear for the impacts on, um, you know, the uh, how that works with with everything else. Just like you're saying. Hey Jen. Also, one of the things we discussed in the meetings too that there really are three classifications of ponds. You have the stormwater management ponds. You have the ag ponds. And you have these non-agricultural ponds that could be community ponds, recreational ponds, fire control ponds that are out there that um, that kind of aren't either the district or or um, the county that's involved in those. And so there was a discussion about MDE being um, in charge of the reviews for those ones that kind of fall in between. Yeah. Yep. That was. You're right. Jen, this is Steve Dorsey. You also have mining mining um, facilities too, large basins that are designed to 378 standards, um, and also mining uh, permanent mining ponds. Yep. No, I I agree. Jen, this is Louis. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Louis from Charles. Um, you know, we're, first of all, uh, applaud your efforts to try to consolidate everything from all the districts is a tough one uh, with, with respect to pond reviews. But, um, you know, we're, you know, hopefully we get some things resolved here within two months, but two months would go by really quickly, as I mentioned at the uh, Southern meeting. But come January 1st, um, I would assume that, you know, January 2nd comes and we review and approve a pond that's been reviewed by a professional engineer at the Soil Conservation District. Um, I'm just wondering what the consequences are of just doing just that, just approving it. And, you know, I think we've checked off the biggest uh, question, which is, you know, that they, it has been reviewed properly to meet the standards. Um, I think we'll all be in that, a lot of us will be in that boat because I don't, uh, that two months is just going to go by really fast. So um, I'm just wondering what, what will happen if, you know, we approve X number of ponds in January that, um, you know, we don't have an agreement yet. So hopefully, uh, hopefully someone has an answer to that because I hope that there aren't any consequences because I think we would have complied. And yeah, it, that's one of the questions that I'm waiting on uh, from MDE as far as the implications of, of the January 1st deadline, what happens um, after that date. And so I, my understanding of it, and um, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong here, 
is that it does have some to do with uh, the comfort level of individual districts in terms of um, whether or not they're comfortable moving forward with status quo. If there is um, a, a mechanism in place currently um, to, to provide these reviews and approvals. Um, but yeah, that is one thing that I'm still waiting on additional clarification on. So Jen, one of the things that, that we're doing is uh, following the October 13th meeting, I reached out to the county and uh, the city of Gaithersburg. I'm still trying to get a meeting with the city of Rockville to bring them up to date on, on kind of what's happening. And I tried to explain to them, I couldn't really get to them sooner than this because there were so many questions uh, and some of them were revealed as part of the October 13th meeting. Um, but I have arranged for MDE on November 5th. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled with the county and the city of Gaithersburg to try to map out what we're supposed to do come January 1st, because we won't have a district on our staff that enables us to be able to sign off on the MD14 um, on January 1st. So. I know that's an eminent um, thing that's coming. Um, we're trying to build into our county budget a proposed engineering position, but as you know, something proposed in a budget and what gets approved is a long road, and we're not sure if that's going to happen. But we do know definitively on January 1st, we won't have the capacity. So I have tried to sort of get that meeting scheduled to try to map out what the process is going to be on January 1st and trying to include the county and the jurisdictions that are involved in the small pond approval process in the county. Uh, and I think that's a great effort uh, to pull that together to, to get clarity within your, your district. And I mean, I understand from talking to a number of you that come January 1st, the plan, at least initially, is to move these back to MDE. Um, in in absence of of that clarity you know so until right. the the questions are answered that um uh, that address some of these questions some of these issues um that that's that's the backstop is for these reviews to go back to mde for and i mean go through their uh dam safety permitting process hey jen this is steve darcy sorry i was late getting on i had a field appointment um we have taken the MOU that the, the template and we've run it through several meetings here with in, in house with uh, John Tarr. He runs the our urban program, Gail Myers, she runs our ag program, and also Joe Bonanno, who, who's uh, number two in our urban program. All three of those individuals are, are licensed PE. So we uh, we have one more iteration to go through uh, polishing it up. We're planning to take that MOU to uh, the district, I mean to our board in December, because in Prince George's, I mean we have a lot of stormwater management ponds that come through here. We we can't wait. Um, we we just can't wait. Um, so I'm not sure. I just throw that out to the group. I don't know how that impacts what was discussed today. I'm looking forward to listening to the whole recording, but just so you know, I mean, we, we're ready to hopefully pr proceed with that. I think we are we may be in a, a unique situation that other districts don't have because I have three professional PEs on staff. Um, so anyhow, I just throw that out there. Um, I don't know, we may have more stormwater management ponds that come through than anybody. I mean, we've We've got one large project right now that have 10 facilities on them that have to meet 378. So, um, and there's no way MDE has the resources to do that. They do small fall under small pond approval. So, I just throw that out for for uh, information. Thanks, Steve. And. Uh I think you already alluded to it, but I see your question in the chat that the this is being recorded and we can make the, the whole recording available later on um, as well. So you can catch up on what you missed earlier. So once I, I get 
answers back from NDE um, that offer some additional clarity for what we're looking at. We are looking at setting up uh, a wrap-up meeting or a follow-up meeting um, for something like this virtually uh, statewide with MDE and other partners um, to make sure that everybody has a, an additional opportunity to bring these issues up and make sure um, that they have all the information that is needed, that you all have all the information that's needed to move forward um, in, in your individual districts. Okay. Okay, any other questions on uh, on review? Okay. Diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Okay. So I had worked on developing a draft policy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. Uh, and, and where a resolution or a policy would fit within the manual. This was something that we talked about at the annual meeting, and it was um, uh, determined then or that we would come back and revisit this at the October meeting. And so I looked at NACD's policy. I looked at uh, the Prince George's district has a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Um, to try and, and put together something that seemed like a good fit for uh, MASCD as a, a state level organization. Um, I'm also working on this same um, process in Delaware with their Association of Conservation Districts. And when I brought this up at their executive committee meeting um, earlier this month, I got some really good feedback that I wanted to bring here as well. Um, because they have interest in developing a policy also, um, it, but what we ran into there and, and some just really thoughtful feedback was that this policy should not be developed in a vacuum, um, that we should be involving um, the organizations, the un um, or, or members of underserved uh, and underrepresented communities that we're trying to reach out to um, before we get too far down the line in developing uh, a new policy. And so what I put together here was something um, that was more intentional to, to go down that particular um, initiative, I guess. Um, and so I, I was looking at a, a few different statements um, that as a draft, there's a, a section in the manual that lists resolutions that uh, relate to MASCD operations. So they're not um, policies as they relate to legislation or, or different programs. And they're also not in our operating role. So this seemed like if we were going to have anything that this was a good place for it to go. Um, and so I was looking at a common statement that was in both the NACD and uh, the Prince George's District's policy um, that the MASCD Board of Directors formally denounces racism and discrimination in any form. And then I was looking at, um, I'm trying to look at this in my own screen in the way, and this is a challenge. Um, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to see my own screen. Aha, I think I figured it out. Okay. Um, so I, what I have here is that MASCD recognizes that it's essential to our mission to serve all members of our local communities through individual conservation districts. MASCD is fully committed in its efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusivity to work with clients, districts, partners, and others. And we commit to gain greater awareness and understanding of issues important to diverse communities, to encourage greater diversity in local elections, and to encourage even greater transparency and open dialogue in conservation district programs. And what I think this leaves us room for is to uh, explore more uh, initiatives that are going on throughout the state um, to reach out to some of these underserved and underrepresented communities to get the feedback that we need 
to develop uh, whatever next steps are appropriate, um, whether it's a, a more complete policy, whether it's recommendations um, for MASCD or for individual districts, um, just to see you know, what makes sense in terms of the next steps. Um, so this was kind of a draft that I wanted to propose to everyone to see if this seemed like the right approach moving forward. Um, I know Dr. Hilsman talked about this uh, as one of the priorities in his report too. And so, you know, that's an example of another group that we should be coordinating with um, as we develop this over time, I think. So I just wanted to pause there and get some feedback if this is kind of the right track or if um, or if I should be taking a different tack. Any comments for Jen on this? This is Chuck Schuster with Howard. There's a great deal of information here to digest and just readily accept. Um, you know, we're, we're coming to a point in time in which we have to make a decision, but we don't know what really all our options are and how we really need to proceed. Are there any other options that we could consider? There are. Um, so a couple of different routes to take are that you can look, what, I, what I've outlined here is kind of a, a basic first policy um, that commits to, to looking at this further uh, as an organization. Um, there are also options to look at and develop a fuller policy on the front end or to put together an ad hoc committee to evaluate uh, maybe a good starting point there would be to take a look at the recommendations from the NACD task force, um, but to put together a smaller group that that looks and develop looks at and develops uh, options specifically for for the board to come back and review, similar to what we've talked about with the um, uh, the budget process earlier in the meeting today. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Mr. President, this is Steve Darcy. So this is a sensitive issue as the silence in the group shows that it is a sensitive issue. Uh, my recommendation to the board is you pause and think about this. And, and I like Jen's idea of having uh, a committee to look more close, uh, maybe a subcommittee to work, work on uh, coming up with uh, a statement. Um, I think each needs to take this seriously and look as individual district, uh, as Prince George just did. Um, we took the leadership, uh, the lead from uh, NACD at their annual meeting, um, and so we followed their 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 guidance and their lead. So um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's so important to take your time and uh, let people discuss it in their individual districts and uh, maybe um, MSAD come up with a committee to um, really make sure you do it correctly. I love the idea of getting uh, the, very, the very communities that we're um, talking about serving and have some input from them. Um, and I think one way yeah association can start and each district can start is uh, diversifying our individual boards so just my just my thoughts 
Thanks, Steve. So can we uh, proceed in that uh, way? Yep, I can reach out to everybody for, because I'll need some volunteers for uh, an ad hoc budget committee and an ad hoc diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, committee as well. And so just um, the only note I would put out with there is, um, you know, sometimes we have some difficulty with engagement uh, among the boards and our standing committees. And so in order for those two efforts to be successful, we really, I, I am in need of people to step up um, and, and volunteer to serve in those capacities. But I'm happy to reach out to everybody to uh, to try and seek out those volunteers too. So. Thanks, Jen. I would urge people to reach out to Jen and and for these two committees, um, both very important items uh, that we need to to address and and uh, work on correctly. So, thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our regular meeting. Uh, is there any other call for business in this meeting? And do we have a meeting after this? Did I, or? Normally we do, we have it on the agenda for our policy development committee for the next, um, uh, the, the next annual meeting, and in this case, the Northeast Region meeting. Um, if it's okay with you, what I would probably like to do is to convene after the Northeast Region meeting next week, and uh, once we have those survey results in hand, um, to get feedback um, from the leadership, from regional representatives, all the, the groups that are listed there um, on on how to develop out the agenda. And I can also share what I've put together so far so that everybody can kind of um, take a look and chew on that and, and see uh, what direction we'd like that to go in. So, so Jen. Not today, but a, later. Let's convene after the NACD uh, Northeastern meeting. <laughs> OK. That sounds good. With that. Uh, if there is no other bit further business, I will ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting. Motion to adjourn, St. Mary's. There a second? Second at Baltimore County. All right, it's been a uh, motion and second to the motion to adjourn. All those opposed to adjourning signify by saying aye. We're adjourned. Thanks for everybody's input and attendance. I really appreciate it, and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks again, and have a safe harvest. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, everyone.